so many companies say customer first, customer first. I actually would argue, no, team, employees first. Because if that's right, they will carry on and make sure the customer is happy too. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. You can't learn a lesson until you apply it to your life. That's why you can understand the lesson and still have to learn it twice. That's something that NQ said to me when he performed a spoken word during his episode on the Why Not Now show. And we're going to focus on this today, this very concept of lessons and application of lessons. I'm sharing my top business blessings with you. A blessing is a lesson that turns into a blessing because you've celebrated it. I'm all about applying the lessons. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I ask the question almost to every guest on this show, what's one lesson you find yourself learning over and over? So ask yourself that right now, whether it's personal or professional, what's one lesson, one trend, one pattern that you see yourself doing over and over and having to relearn this lesson? And Maybe the trick is that you're just not applying your learning. You understand it, you understand what's going on, but you actually aren't applying it to the next situation. And so this pattern and this cycle continues and continues. We all do this. And as a heads up, the new dates for the next Renegade Brand Bootcamp program and enrollment have been announced. You can head to renegadebrandbootcamp.com if you want to learn more. This is the uh, career love of my life. I absolutely adore and love this program because it's a collection of like-minded and like-hearted driven women who are coming together to level up. I share everything I've learned over the last 20 years in business. I share all my blessings (laughs) and um, it is equal parts education, collaboration, accountability and community. So if you are looking to level up with your business, with your career, um, you might check it out, renegadebrandbootcamp.com, especially if you are looking to really grow your personal presence online, understand your brand essence and how to articulate that forward. What do you do? Who are you? What is your personal brand? And um, maybe you're looking to launch a podcast, write a book, do more public speaking, really inject your why into your business and your story to create that connection because connections convert. So all of those things, if that sounds interesting to you, head to renegadebrandbootcamp.com. All you have to do really is the first step is sign up for the emails. I'll help educate you on what this is about and you can decide if it's for you or not. Uh, One of the things that I learned a long time ago from Mark Cuban was that the biggest investment we can make is the investment in ourselves. So when I went to him seeking investment advice, I thought I was going to get some real estate or stock market guidance, and he said, absolutely not. Invest in yourself. Invest in your own growth, your company's growth. That is the best ROI you will ever have. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. 
Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery, the original before-you-go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you-know-what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit Poopery.com and Why Not Now listeners get 20% off with code Why Not Now. That's all one word. And you can hear the story about poopery in our interview with founder Susie Batiste. That's Why Not Now, episode 28. Poopery is also available at Bed Bath & Beyond. So today I have three business blessings that I'm going to share with you and the application of them, some literal, tangible, tactical examples Now, when I started my first company in 2009, uh, eventually I realized, okay, the team and I need to start celebrating what we're learning because that's a way to share it with others on the team. So we ended up getting some paint that's chalkboard paint. And in our office, we had one large wall where we painted this wall with the chalkboard paint and there's special markers that go with it. And anytime someone messed up, jacked up, you can call it failure, you can call it a lesson, a blessing, whatever term you decide, but something went wrong that they knew they could do differently next time. They're failing forward, if you'd like to call it that. They would write this down on the wall, big, and they could design it however they want. It could be big, huge. They would write it down on the wall for everyone to see. And we would literally celebrate this because it would acknowledge and surface this lesson to everyone. Expose it to everyone in the company. When you would walk by the blessing wall, everyone could see it. You'd be reminded of things that you could learn from others and apply. So potentially leapfrogging other people's blessings (laughs) and accelerating our process of learning. So I encourage you, even if it's at home with your family, it could be in your workspace, why not have a blessing wall? Maybe it's just a a chalkboard or some sort of sticky note wall. Like, write it down. Because if we can apply that, then we're accelerating our process of growth. What I love about this is a blessing becomes a point of pride. Instead of us looking at this as a weakness, it is celebrated so we can use it as an asset. And it's important to be specific about your blessings if you decide to have a blessing wall. Here are three of my biggest business blessings and how I've applied my lessons literally into the next iteration, whether it's a new business or a new situation. And so you can see kind of the contrast of when things didn't go well and then the application. Um, But I really encourage you as this episode continues on, think about your blessings and how could you celebrate them and share them. So my biggest business blessing to date, I will say, is realizing we only have 24 hours in a day and humans aren't necessarily scalable. This is this was a really tough one for me to understand and there are ways around this. So technically there are things we can do to quote unquote scale ourselves. However, if we don't understand our human capacity, it can be detrimental to ourselves as individuals in our personal lives, but also in our business and everyone around us in our businesses. So in my case, you know, most of you, whether you have a business or you're thinking about starting a business, you realize that you are the face of the brand. You are the face of the company, the human behind the brand. And that's so important. I talk about that all the time and really hang my hat on that. However, It's important to set ourselves up, whether it's a small company, a company that doesn't even exist yet, but it's in concept, or you're years down the road and and you're just now kind of coming to this conclusion. It's important we set ourselves up for success. So in my case, when I first started my first company, I definitely was that, you know, human behind the brand. I was the company, right? Most of us start that way, even if it's not a service-based company. It could be, you know, you're, you have some sort of product you're selling. You're still it. You are it. And that's important and that's key. But if we make it to where the whole company resides on our 
hours in the day, literally, then your opportunity for growth is stinted, right? So a few ways around this. And first, actually, let me share what I did. So here, I definitely was the face of the brand and had an agency. And because of the way that the trends were going with social media and things were were evolving so quickly, it was kind of the wild, wild west days, people were looking to me for what you know, they could learn from my case studies. And we started growing and adding more clients. It was a service-based company. You know, we were basically sharing our expertise, which becomes your time unless you find a different way to distribute it. Well, I found myself, even though I was hiring more people to join the company and we were growing very quickly, people were still looking to me as the expert To a certain extent, that's okay, but when it becomes the point where you have to be in every single meeting, regardless of where they are around the globe, that becomes unsustainable, right? Because we only have 24 hours a day. We can only be on one plane at a time, and eventually you start to burn out if you are not sleeping and trying to be all things to all people in all places. So it was important to realize this was was a tough lesson, man. I mean, I I really did literally burn out. And now what I realize after kind of reframing and applying this understanding, I realize there are things I could have done differently. Even though I was empowering my team to step up and be the me in the meeting, I could have set them up for success even more and actually trained the clients to look to them more as the voice of authority versus me so much. I could have delegated more, um, understood what I was uniquely qualified to do and only doing that, outsourcing the other things. Uh, Eventually, I started to, what I refer to as as productize our intellectual property. So through writing the book, um, starting the online university, uh, finding ways to, to scale, per se, your IP is a big, huge asset when you are the face of the brand. So if you're listening to this and you you are a coach of some sort or you have a business model that's one-to-one and your economic model resides solely on your time in the day, maybe you're, you're charging by an hourly rate or something, thinking about ways that you can productize what you know, productize your intellectual property is really important and you know, I, I feel like the word scale, scaling your business, scaling yourself gets thrown around a lot. And sometimes I cringe when I hear that word because maybe you don't need to scale. Maybe you are happy doing exactly what you're doing in your current scenario and you don't need to go further or faster. That's okay. Realizing your capacity and what makes sense for you and where you want to be is extremely important. So I kind of refer to it as like your human capital or or your human capacity. Knowing how you want to leverage those hours in the day or not is really important. So that starts with intention and rooting yourself with, okay, what am I capable of doing and what do I want to do? Because at the end of the day, we are just humans that are running these companies and we have to decide where do we want technology to come in if that's going to help us or not? What can we automate? And it's all just a very intentional decision. So looking at now with my second company, here I have very few people that are they're actually operating within the company, but we've just changed the way we do a lot of things. A lot more as automated, much more intentional about selecting what makes sense to be doing versus just more volume, more volume. Um, It's a completely different company, but even with the Why Not Now show, it's media. Media is dipping into different budgets uh, for partners than, you know, production or service um, deliverables. So it's it's a completely different ballgame, but it's been very intentional. So thinking through how many hours do I have in the day and how am I going to use them and how can they work harder for me is key and or how can I set my expectations to where I can govern my growth a little bit more. Business lesson number two, company culture is everything. So if we get the company culture right and you might be thinking, I don't really have a company of people yet, it's just me or I'm going to start off and it's just going to be me in the beginning. That's okay, but eventually 
you likely will have someone helping you, even if it's a freelancer, if it's a contractor, if it's an intern. And then some of you are listening and you have companies and maybe you're focused on enhancing that company culture or you should be. So regardless of what size you are, this lesson applies to you. It could be your cat (laughs) right now that is your company culture. Now, I inherently know this and knew this and understood this concept because one of my mentors, especially when I started my first company, was Tony Shea. He is the CEO of Zappos. And if you just even Google, it's H-S-I-E-H is his last name, Shea. It's pronounced differently than it appears. Um, If you Google him and just Zappos culture, you will see they have been an icon. They have been a landmark for an example of really good company culture. Because one of the things he realized is if you get the team right and if if the team is happy and feeling fulfilled, they will in turn make your product service better for your customer. So, so many companies say customer first, customer first. I actually would argue no, team, employees first. Because if that's right, they will carry on and make sure the customer is happy too. So this is something that inherently a lot of us know, like in, you know, logically. Intellectually, this makes sense. And if you want to dive deeper into Tony's story, he wrote a book called Delivering Happiness. And it's a great book regardless of kind of your focus, just business book and his journey. Um, but a lot of this is explained in that book. And one of the things he taught me is when you're creating core values for your business, even if it's just you, you know, this doesn't need to be a huge company and you don't need to wait to create core values. Definitely create them out of the gate. It should be your entire team that's creating these values, not just the leadership, not just the founder, not just the boss, because you want everyone to be bought in and to create and mold the guardrails and the meeting and purpose and what's what's going to be your pillars. It's important because if that's dictated, then not everybody's going to be bought in and invested in this. So what I've done is, you know, sometimes I'll throw out a couple and ask everybody to build an add-on. Or we'll start with a list um, with with my first company. You know, we grew pretty quickly. So we were revisiting our core values fairly frequently. And we created them together and then we check in, you know, once every six months and say, do these still hold true? Do we need to make any just adjustments? Do we need to remove any, add any, edit any? And we decide as a team and everybody collectively is on the same page with the core values. And they don't feel like they've just been dictated and slapped on the wall, and there are these guardrails that that weren't created by the whole team. I think it's important, too, to realize these are fluid. As you change, your company changes, your team evolves, that's going to make an impact on your core values and the reflection of them to a certain extent. I wouldn't say you're going to do a 180 necessarily, but it's important to keep revisiting these and to truly have them be you know, not just a nice saying, a company line, but living the core values and making sure that you are walking the talk, all of you, not just leadership, everyone. And back to the concept of culture, team is everything, I think about hiring and firing. And another thing that I learned from Tony Shea was we wait too long to hire and we tend to wait too long to fire. So, if we're focused on culture and you have someone on your team and maybe they're, they are a contractor, maybe they're a full-time employee, whoever it is, if they are not jiving with the team and there isn't alignment, the longer you wait to let them go and let them move on to what might be a better fit and let your team find someone else who is a fit, the worse the situation will be. So we wait too long to hire and we wait too long to fire. If you have the notion that this person is not right for the company, don't wait another two weeks, two months, two years. We've all been in those situations where 
maybe we're working for a company and we know someone's got to, they're going to get fired. We're pretty sure. They're just, it's not working out. But the the process is delayed. That just creates a negative impact on the rest of the team and the rest of the company as a whole. So we also wait too long to hire. Now, it's it's tough to sometimes make that first step when we are a first-time entrepreneur because it's scary. That's money going out the door for someone doing something that you think I could be doing that or you feel responsible for their livelihood. It's a big undertaking. But oftentimes we are actually stunting our growth by not allowing ourselves to bring someone else on and empower them. And what we think is going to be a huge liability to bring someone else on to help actually could be managed and and can be done in a little bit of a safe enough to try way. Start slow, start part-time, start as a freelancer, then bring on to a full-time employee. There are ways to do it, but don't wait um, so long and restrict your, your growth and also your sanity potentially of trying to do everything yourself. One of the ways that I really like to create alignment with the team and creating that healthy company culture is by rewarding not only for performance, but for the energy that's brought into the company. So if if the team is in alignment, everything is going to flow better, grow more naturally, and and just be clicking along. Um, I really believe in team members having skin in the game. And having something that's what's in it for me to really latch on to. And in, with my first company, for example, we offered stock options. And that was a way to really allow the team to understand they're invested too in this company because they have a payoff at the end of the day. They have ownership. And it's not just about the money. It's actually, it's about feeling truly a part of this company. You are a part of it. And I feel like we behave differently. We perform differently when we have skin in the game. And it's not, again, I, I can't focus on this enough. It's, it's about a mentality and an attitude of alignment just as much as the potential ROI and, and having that upside. So if there's a way you can offer an incentive program or reward your team, it may not be stock options, maybe there's another function that's really important in my mind. And also understanding the people that you're working with that you are either employing or um, if you're working with a freelancer or a contractor and even an intern, understanding what is their biggest form of reward. It's not always money. In fact, with my first company, I realized they might, they're a little bit of a different generation than I was. I, I was brought up thinking, okay, you get in, you pay your dues, you start to earn more money, and it's just a little bit of an older school mentality. Yes, that's always going to be true to a certain extent, but not everybody is just financially motivated. For example, there were quite a few people in my first company that I employed who almost would rather take more time off than a higher salary. And so their time and flexibility or ability to work from home at times was more valuable to them than a bigger paycheck. So asking the question, understanding what motivates my team? It's not always money. And there actually might be a better outcome if you can find the right formula for them. Because of course time is money, but also flexibility and having an understanding that you know you can decide your own hours maybe. That might be worth more than an extra $10,000 a year to someone. So asking the questions and understanding, getting to know what motivates these people? I think one of my blessings on this front was, um, you know, company culture is just a big term that gets thrown around. It's not having an ice cream cart show up on Fridays at all. True culture and having, you know, a team of people that are invested in each other, not just professionally, but also personally, it comes with its own complications, right? When when everybody's friends at a company, like best friends, and they hang out 
after hours, they hang out and love each other during, you know, work hours. And work kind of bleeds into all times of day and days of the week because it's the it's it's an alignment thing. You have a parallel and you have something in common. It comes with challenges sometimes because your relationships and your emotions are that much deeper. And I know for me, I tend to hire people I like. Like who doesn't, right? I mean, to a certain extent, it's it makes life so much more enjoyable and easier when you're working with people you like. And I do I do not uh, regret that. And also. I think there are times where, with startups especially, everybody's so close and so tight, sometimes it's hard to remove emotion from certain situations and to not take things personally because you have such a relationship and history with that other individual. And as the founder, as the entrepreneur, someone still has to be in charge per se, right? (laughs) And so it does make it a little bit more challenging, but it's definitely worth it. And I think you have to have that much more emotional intelligence if you are going to run your company that way. And there are times where I think, you know, I would fall in and out of that, where sometimes you have to have that hat on of being the boss, and then you might other times be hanging out with your best friend who happens to be someone you're employing. And so being really cognizant of that relationship and understanding boundaries, but also understanding this is just an innovative way to approach this. It may not look the same as anyone else, but it works for me. There, there is no right or wrong, but being really intentional about managing those relationships is, is key because it can get very sticky and tricky at times, as you can imagine. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you are digging this podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment and it means a ton to us. Also, after recording more than 100 episodes, I've created a bit of a cheat sheet on the top five things I've learned from Renegades and how they get from idea to action, from dreaming to doing. I will email you the downloadable PDF when you subscribe to my newsletter. Just head to amyjoemartin.com and click on connect with me. Business lesson number three, focus. For sure, this is, um, you know, a little bit of a trap I've fallen into from time to time to time. And that is, I have something called shiny object syndrome, where if things are clicking along, the business is doing well, I think, oh, this over here could be added. It's kind of like distraction, shiny object syndrome. And there's a good and bad to this because, yes, you want to be open-minded about different opportunities, divisions, ways your economic model could be enhanced or added to. Streams of revenue, oh, don't we love adding more of those? However, so many cases... I have seen myself then lose focus of the core competency. So I'll never forget, there was a time where we thought um, at my first company it would be wise to add a tech division because we had this wizard tech person and we were starting to see the supply and demand needs (laughs) um, meet each other. And we thought, oh, let's add a little tech division and we can help solve these problems for our clients too. That was not our core competency, and it actually was a distraction. And I look back and I laugh now, but we probably could have saved a lot of time and money if we wouldn't have gone down that distracting rabbit hole. So be careful of that shiny object syndrome. Let's say you're starting a bakery. Great. Focus on the bakery. If it's brick and mortar, you have a retail bakery outlet focus on that. You probably don't need to be starting a catering division right now or finding ways to sell merchandise around the bakery. Like Just focus on the core competency. It sounds so obvious, but it becomes so easy to start to spin off and think that you're adding these other components to the company that will make it so much bigger, yet it's actually going to take away and be potentially detrimental to the company especially with the founder having shiny object syndrome, like I tend to have at times, you're setting the tone. So you are setting the tone of what the priorities are for the company. And if you're constantly looking around and changing gears, your team will be too. 
And then there's no focus, and then there's very little productivity in a straight direction. So shiny object syndrome, it can get you, let me tell you. And I love a good old pendulum swing. So if I find myself with shiny object syndrome, sometimes I'll swing and do a 180 and be hyper-focused. And if we have blinders on, we're not being open to potential opportunity. So there is a happy middle way here. Um, It doesn't mean we have to run off every time we think of a new idea, direction, segment of the company, division, economic model, whatever. But being open and taking note might inform a decision we could make in a year or in six months that could be a huge aspect of the company. So it's like being able to kind of dance and groove and play along and be friends with your shiny object syndrome and be like, hey, oh, I see you. I see what I'm doing right now. Note to self. And if that keeps surfacing five more times in the next three weeks, you might actually give it more attention. But it doesn't mean changing your day at noon and saying, okay, we're going to go off in this direction, 100 miles an hour. That's not probably the smartest. And with this lesson I've had many times about focus, starting simple, as simple as can be, is best because you can always add from there. And I think sometimes we get so in our own game that we forget our customers. They don't have the context. They don't have the history. If they are interfacing with this idea for the first time, it needs to be simple. If you can't explain your idea, your business concept, to your mom or to your cat in a quick, eloquent, simple way, then revisit for sure. Um, You might have this grand idea and maybe in five years you will get there, but start with the most core key 30% first and then add the different areas and and layers. Um, But starting really simple is key. So the net net here, the moral of this story is celebrate your blessings, own them, call them out. They are not a sign of weakness. It is not doomsday. You're not failing. You're just being smart about it, right? And share them, share them with your team, share them with your community. If you have a you know group of people that you collaborate with, share them and encourage them to share theirs as well because we truly can accelerate the process of learning, of growth, of just progress if we do share those because we can leapfrog other people's blessings, snag their lessons free of charge, and apply them. And on the personal side, I can tell you one of my biggest blessings lately, it's something I continue to learn until I apply it more and more, is pace. I tend to go really quick out of the gate and I just, I think a sprint is going to be great. And it turns out, of course, that's not sustainable. So I continue to learn the pacing lesson, lesson, um, over and over, and I do apply it, and it seems like it will either always creep back up or it'll elevate. It's like a, a new layer, a new, you've got your master's in pacing, and now it's time you get your PhD, and I get schooled again. So pacing, whether that's personally or professionally, is is so key. I look back at times where I would sprint and get ahead and it would feel good, but then I'd have to rest for so long or maybe I'd even quit. And then everybody else would just catch up with me. So if I would have paced a little bit better, uh, I, I would have probably gotten to the, you know, whether it's a reward or to the outcome at the same amount of time it would have taken me if I wouldn't have sprinted or if I would have sprinted. So, yeah, pace is your friend as well. That concludes my blessings. I have a million more, uh, but those are the ones that come really top of mind. I encourage you to share your blessings with me and with this Why Not Now community. Make sure you are in the Why Not Now private Facebook group if you want to be collaborating with everyone. Share your blessings. I would love to hear them. We can celebrate them together. That can be the blessing wall on the Facebook wall, and it can be our virtual blessing wall. The other thing that I've done with teams, and I have right now with my own team and with the Renegade Brand Bootcamp alumni, we have Slack channels or Slack workspaces. And one of the channels in the workspace is 
lessons, and we celebrate them in there. So there's a way to do this virtually, even if you don't have a, a team of people per se, but you're just collaborating with, with people that you are learning from. Have a blessing wall. Why not? Back to the words of NQ, I will wrap up by saying you can't learn a lesson until you apply it to your life. That's why you can understand the lesson and still have to learn it twice. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your Why Not Now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to whynotnow at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now?